Okay, <clears throat> so the, um, the next section we'll look at um, going back about eight years to the climate impact assessment that we did with the city of Aspen and others. Um, so it'd be kind of a look at how we looked at the problem eight years ago and a little bit on what's happened since then in terms of building collaboration in the valley. And after that, then Bill Travis is going to say a few things about um, adaptation and vulnerability in mountain communities in general. So from the case study of Aspen and the Roaring Fork Valley out to the Rocky Mountains. So to pick up on what Ashley was just talking about, um, this fellow right here is Walter Pepke. This is uh, Steve Scadron's counterpart in 1947, uh, the mayor of Aspen, and this is the governor of Colorado. And they were here in 1947 to commemorate the longest uh, ski lift in the world, according to their own advertising right up there. And I think it's interesting to also go back to the 1800s when the mining boom started. The silver mining um, pumped the population up from the Ute Indians, which were kind of here in the summer and not here in the winter, to about 10,000 people in the 1890s in Pitkin County. This blue graph is the population of the Roaring Fork Valley. I'm sorry, of Pitkin County, which is the upper part of the Roaring Fork Valley. And you can see that after silver was devalued, the population began a precipitous drop, and it bottomed out during the Depression in the 1930s. There are very few people here, but the infrastructure, the buildings of the town, it was almost a ghost town. And then this event occurred. So boom to bust to boom. 1947, the ski lift. During the 50s, the ski industry grew. Um, in the 60s, the 70s, very steep growth. The growth has slowed down a little bit. But this dash line is the state demographer's uh, projection of population in Pit Pitkin County out to 2030, which isn't that far in the future. So we'll see how the state demographer's projection works out. I finished up in Hamburg talking, talking about the process of how the uh, climate impact assessment got started. Um, it started with the city, a, a staff person considering vulnerabilities for the town. Um, that led to elected officials and the city council and the mayor um, talking with us about doing a study. This was coincident with the formation of a community group called the Global Warming Alliance, which gave guidance to the development of the Canary Initiative. One of the first things we did in getting the study going was to contact um, the public and targeted specific stakeholders to find out, this is again eight years ago, what, what do you think about when you think about climate change? All of this led then to the report, um, which I'll, I'll show a few, few of the findings from. So that process led to these uh, components of the Canary Initiative. The um, assessment which is the report I'm talking about. Another report, which was a detailed inventory of carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases in a study area that basically went the area surrounding Aspen out to the airport. Um, and there's been two reports and a third in preparation. We have. Um, the development of an action plan, which initially focused on mitigation. And then uh, we developed um, invited public interaction and education and public outreach. 
So those components make up a, a kind of a suite of things the Canary Initiative set out to do. And as you've seen, the watershed um, is, is dominated by Pitkin County, but in terms of getting watershed cooperation, there's four counties, Gunnison, Eagle, and Garfield as well. So as we begin to think about impacts and adaptation mitigation strategies in the watershed as a whole, there's a lot of towns and four counties to bring into the tent. Initially, when we were talking to the town, um, one of the things that they could trust was the record, the observations. So this is temperature in Colorado, and this goes from a little before 1900 to 2010. And so there is a, a trend, a warming trend in the state, and that's something that the public tended to trust. The concerns that they laid out um, were what you might imagine. We've, we've heard about fire, um, how will climate affect wildlife, skiing, uh, water recreation, water quality, um, water use such as agriculture. There are other concerns um, having to do with battles over who gets the water. There's demand for the water in the east on the other side of the Rocky Mountains and there's demand to the west out to the states west of us uh, all the way out to California. We also have concern on ecosystems, riparian habitat, um, fishing recreation, summer recreation, all of those affected by climate change. We set up as part of the study in-depth interviews that actually uh, Bill Travis and his graduate student Hannah Gosnell and staff from AGCI conducted and these were transcribed, and they're a rich resource of ideas that came from all these different uh, types of people in the valley, from uh, what Dave's counterpart in years past, uh, irrigation, ditch manager, rancher, ski area manager, so on. We also had um, people from the US Forest Service, um, local environmental scientists, conservation group leaders, um, land stewards that are um, doing land conservation easements involved in these, these interviews. Now, one of the things that was pretty striking is long before climate change was a big issue, there was already adaptation going on, but it was adaptation to natural variability. This is probably a little bit hard to read, but it's skier days going from 200,000 to over uh, almost 2 million. And these are skier days on all four Aspen ski mountains in the years 1966 to 2005. And you'll notice this point right here was the 1976-1977 year. And that winter, there was hardly any snow until after Christmas. And there was also no snowmaking in Aspen. A few years later, well, things went back to normal. But then a few years later, 1980, 81, it happened again, but not as much. And the skiing company used that great variation, not only in skier visits, but their income, to drive a strategy towards making snow. So it's actually probably the most expensive and most clear example of adaptation in the valley beyond the initial adaptation of moving stream flow to irrigate pasture. So some of the key findings are um, not a big surprise today. But back in eight years ago, there were things for people really to chew on. The notion that precipitation might not change that much, but more would 
fall as rain, um, possible mid to late winter thaws, rain on snow events, which dampen uh, a lot of uh, winter recreation, and minimum stream flows threatened from the annual hydrologic cycle, but also from other aspects such as um, demand on water, like making snow and growing population. Since eight years ago, an example of the kind of new research going on, most a lot of it right over the mountains in Boulder, um, has to do with what uh, Ashley just mentioned, where we have um, dust on snow, and from, from outer space, you can actually pick up, this is our area right here, these red areas are um, the radiative forcing how much uh, sunlight the snow uh, is absorbing because of that darkening effect on dust. And this is having a dramatic effect on our hydrology. The hydrology itself was very difficult to simulate, but we did our best with somewhat uh, crude methods to, to basically look at the snowpack and look at climate change and then run that through a snowmelt model, and what you can see as the basic message with different future scenarios is that peak runoff would shift two, three, four weeks earlier. And this has a dramatic effect on water availability, agriculture, et cetera. We also um, did our best using Landsat data, snowmelt models, and the models of the time to try and get a sense of the future going out to 2100, what might a snow-covered area on Aspen Mountain be like with a very high carbon dioxide emission future where snow-covered area is reduced greatly, the red is what it is currently, and these are emission scenarios that are low and medium emission scenarios. So if we stay on the current high emission path, skiing on Aspen Mountain will be dramatically different. We also took a look at um, vulnerability in ecosystems. One way to approach that was to identify habitat specialists. And there's a long list. This is just some of them. But you can see that we identified um, a species, um, the kind of habitat it is in, and part of the study looked at how those habitats are shifting in elevation upslope. Some of the suggestions that came forward from the interviews are very practical, common sense kinds of things. Um, obviously, expand snowmaking for the skiing. From an agricultural perspective, there are other ideas. Um, and that left us kind of at eight years ago at the end of what we could do with that particular study. But it was clear the canary would go on and that we needed to develop more watershed scale collaboration. And I'll just uh, conclude here with some of the exciting things that have happened since the initiative eight years ago. Um, the canary initiative and the Aspen Global Warming Alliance have continued. Um, we have our carbon inventory updated. We've developed climate action plan uh, with mitigation goals, an adaptation plan uh, that Lauren started to work on and now Ashley will be working on is underway. Um, there's a future forest roundtable looking at uh, all different aspects of the White River National Forest um, that the Roaring Fork Valley is nestled into. We have uh, the Forest Health Index, which is a new project that maybe there'll be a chance to learn more about later. And the Roaring Fork Watershed Collaborative, which did a massive state of the watershed report looking at many aspects and a watershed action plan that was created in 2012. Um, Sharon Clark is here. Um, can tell you more about that. So that's just some of what's 
going on currently and we hope to build from what we learned in this workshop. So thank you. Maybe we'll take a couple questions as uh, we're changing out the presentations. Any questions for John? John? Yes. Uh, are we going to hear at the meeting at all about the whole question of water law? The reason I ask that is that the distribution of water is such a big issue. I mean, ideally, you wouldn't allow any interbasin water transfers. That train left the station hundreds of years ago here. Uh, there are places that still don't allow that, by the way. Uh, but since it has been allowed, and since water law is so well developed, it seems to me a large part of the future of what we're going to be talking about here is going to be determined by water law, by water ownership, by legal agreements among states. Are we going to hear about that much at this meeting? Well, uh, I don't know that it's actually going to be presented, but um, the whole last chapter, but here's the report, by the way. The whole last chapter is is a look at some of that water law and the pull of water to the east and to the west, and the discussion of the Colorado Compact, which requires Colorado to let water flow out to states to the west, and it covers some of the kinds of things that happen where the senior water rights uh, Trump, the junior rights, and uh, but uh, okay, no, that's fine. Is yeah. that is that going to be available to us? It's online. Oh, it's online. Uh, okay. On our website. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, did you mention, of course. You mentioned John the stakeholder interviews or the eight years ago. Can you tell me something about the method? How you gather data? Was it survey? Was it workshops? Who was who? Okay. Was interviews? What? Yeah. Um, I'll give a quick answer. Maybe. Uh, yeah. We did in-depth interviews with about a dozen people. We had town hall meetings with with many people. And, and there we did flip charts and focus groups and all kinds of strategies to, to gather ideas and concerns. We're going to have about 15 minutes of discussion. You, <laughs> Keep going. We're going to have about 15 minutes of discussion after uh, Bill presents. Okay. So, um,